Welcome. I'm going to start on time. I like to reward the good people that come on time, you know. See, basic operant conditioning. Uh, so uh, I see all this money spent on studying the brain, you know, and everybody enthralled to studying the brain. And every time you hear a psychologist talk, they have to talk about the brain. And some people have referred to it as neurobabble. Um, yeah, but, but so, you know, the United, the, um, we had the decade of the brain, right? And uh, both in the United States and, and Europe. And the National Institutes uh, of Mental Health spends $1.3 billion a year. That's with nine zeros after it. That's our, that's our mental health organization, the organization that we pay for uh, to improve mental health. Uh, in, in the country, and I don't have precise data on this, uh, but my guess from reading what they say and write, they spend about 70% of their money on the brain, on drugs, uh, electroshock, studying the brain, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm concerned about this because I really don't see how we're going to get much benefit from it. Um, I don't see it, but I'm open to hearing how we might get some benefit from studying the brain. Um, so let me tell you how I think about that. Um, when a person comes to us uh, suffering from mental illness, when a person is, is unhappy, suffering all kinds of symptoms, we have a choice about how we intervene, you know? We can intervene at the level of the brain, and we do that with drugs, and with electroshock, and with magnetic trans simulation. At one point, we do with lobotomy. Uh, so we can intervene at the level of the brain, or we can intervene at the level of the mind. And it's pretty clear to me that um, the benefit-risk ratio of intervening at the mind is so much greater so much better than the benefit-risk ratio of intervening at the brain that uh, we're not going to get a lot of benefit. Well, gonna, let's put this way. We're going to get much more bang for our buck if we study the mind and learn how to help people use their minds in healthier, more satisfying ways. So I'll just say a few words about the benefit-risk ratios. So the benefit of intervening at the level of the brain is a person might start feeling better, you know, and uh, they might, if they're in a manic episode and their thoughts are racing, they might be able to, to, to sort of slow down their thoughts so they could participate in the conversation. Um, but I think basically that's it. You know, might feel just feeling better, a little bit less agitated. Now, I have to ask myself the question, why would somebody who's just suffered a horrible loss or who has deep concerns about his or her life want to feel better. You know, I don't get that. I, I don't want you to feel better. I think you ought to feel pretty bad and learn about the feeling bad and, and, and sit with the feeling bad and experience the feeling bad because maybe if you do that, you may do something about it. You'll be motivated to do something about it. And in the case of, of the pain from loss, you know, one of the wonderful things about loss is that it tells us in a very visceral way what's precious to us and what we want to protect and nurture. And I had to wonder, what's the survival value of grief, this horrible, painful experience? Well, one of the survival values is that it tells me what's precious to me and what I want to nurture in my life. Pretty good thing to know. So anyway, that's a, that's a whole side issue, you know, but it seems to me like feeling good is way overvalued in our society, and we ought to learn how to feel bad. So, but let's just say, okay, that the benefit from drugs and electroshock, maybe you might feel better, uh, but only for a while. In the case of electroshock, the relapse rate's very high, and uh, like within three or four months, people have to be re-shocked. So that's the benefit of intervening at the level of the brain. Well, what are the risks? Well, the risks are really big. Uh, sexual dysfunction, 
akathisia, a horrible restlessness that's, that you can't beat, uh, risk of heart attack, risk of mania, um, emotional blunting, loss of conscience, loss of caring, uh, pretty big loss. And in the case of antipsychotics, which are more and more being prescribed, even to, even to kids, you got brain shrinkage, cognitive impairment, Parkinson's disease, um, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, early death. Uh, people who use neuroleptics die on average 25 years younger than people who don't. And the more neuroleptics they use, uh, the earlier they die. So th th these are not really side effects. These are heavy duty major effects. So I, I, I say, wow, there are a lot of, a lot of risk here, a, a lot of damage, and not a lot of benefit. Now, let's take the case of the, the mind, intervening at the level of the mind. Essentially, with all kinds of psychotherapy. When I think about psychotherapy, I think, you know, psychotherapy writ large, right? You know, not just talk therapy, but all kinds of body therapies and hypnotherapy and support groups and art therapy and expressive therapies. And let's take psychotherapy and, and look at it in a, in a larger way. And so I say the benefits, wow, psychotherapy, I can learn, I can develop skills and knowledge that I can use for the rest of my life to live well, to live the way I want to live. I can learn about myself. I can learn what makes me tick why I do what I do and why I don't do what I can do. do. I can develop compassion for myself. I can, uh, I can learn how to relate to other people in more, more satisfying ways, and I can use that for the rest of my life. What are some other, I mean, benefits of psychotherapy, maybe that I'm not... You have a sense you can do something about something that's constructive. They're pretty big. It's, you really learn about agency. Yeah. I can make a difference in my life. Uh, I can learn how to manage myself. I think in terms of managing this organism. I got this organism, and I, it's my job to manage it. I can think, I can feel, I can intend, I can perceive, I can react. And, and psychotherapy helps me learn how to do that, how to use my thoughts and my, my emotions and my attention. Yes? And just as you pointed out with regards to, to grief, I've had a lot of times with clients in depression or severe anxiety where it's very validating to say, well, given this set of parameters, you should feel depressed. Yeah. You know, it's actually healthy. You know, there's it, nothing, it, you know, to shift the paradigm and their sense of self into nothing's wrong with me, and then, like you said, shift into the agency. Right. It has been really profound sometimes. Exactly. That idea of agency, I think, is really powerful. So here's a benefit of, of psychotherapy, pretty, pretty big. I mean, I can develop skills and knowledge that I'll use for the rest of my life. And what are the risks, really? Well, money, a little bit of money, uh, time. Uh, you know, you might learn some things that are, are, are going to hurt you maybe a little bit, not help you. You might, get, you might go down the wrong path for a while, right? What are some other? Any other risks? Yeah, the risk is now I know I am responsible. Mm. Oh, yeah, well, I don't want to know that. That's scary. <laughs> That's scary. That's, yeah, right. I might, I might put some pressure on myself that I don't want to have. I might all of a sudden realize, wow, you know, it's up to me. So, so maybe that, that could be called a risk. But, of course, if you, if you can negotiate that risk and learn from it, of course, you've learned something very valuable. So, Unexpected yeah. life changes, life choices that may be different, anywhere from career to family to a divorce to coupling in some way. To, I mean, there are all kinds of ways that that can happen. And, you know, right. it's not a conventional risk, but it is the risk of, of change. It is risk. So you, in psychotherapy, you might go through some changes. And it's even more of a risk for your partner, for, for your lover or your spouse. For you to go into psychotherapy, they should be scared. <laughs> Any spouse or, you know, oh, my God, it's going to change. Uh, <laughs> Right. So yeah, there's some risks. There are. There are some. But it seems to me like the benefit-risk ratio of intervening at the level of the mind is much, 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 much better than intervening at the level of the brain. And so I'm saying, well, why are we spending all this time on the brain? And, and, and it's just not going to do us that much good, I don't think. 
So let me say a little bit about the mind and the brain. Well, the brain, we know something about the brain, you know, 100, brilliant, 100 billion neurons, uh, maybe billions and billions of connections, synapses and, and uh, neurotransmitters and glial cells and neuronal transmission. And we have some idea about the structural differences, the amygdala and, and the insula and the prefrontal cortex. And we've learned some things about the brain, but not very much, actually. Uh, not as much as you might think if you read the popular press. <laughs> now, uh, well, friends, we don't know anything about memory. I'm so little about memory. We don't know really where it is, how it works. How is it that I can bring up uh, the image of the, the apartment I lived in when I was five years old? I can do it. It's there. I can do it very precisely. How do I do that? Where is that? How does that work? We don't know. We have no idea about how that works. Now, so the brain is this organ that, okay, the mind, my God, the mind is this incredibly powerful, rich, vastly powerful faculty that we use to do everything we do. I mean, we use it to build civilizations, to do art, to understand the world, to understand ourselves, to, to relate to other people, to play sports. The mind is what we do to live our lives. It's what we use. Now, what is it? What is the mind? You know, that is really unknown. It, it, it's just not known. And, um, and there's a lot of people that have spent many years and, and a lot of time trying to figure it out. Now, what I learned recently is that the people who have been doing most of the work on trying to understand the mind are actually philosophers. There's a, there, there's a subdomain, a subdiscipline of philosophy called philosophy of mind. And if you look at philosophy of mind, you can read tomes about the mind. But, but there are all kinds of different ideas about it. There are philosophers who believe that the mind is contained in this organism somewhere, somehow that it's in here. There are philosophers who believe, no, nah, no, nah, I don't think so. Uh, it can't all be here. It's got to be, we got to be picking up some of it from outside. Uh, there are uh, 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 non-reductive physicalists. I don't know what that is even. A non-reductive <laughs> There are a non-reductive phys physicalist. There are dualists that believe that, no, the, the mind is something different from this organism somehow. You know, Rupert Sheldrake, the, the life scientist, believes that the brain is a transmitter. And it's picking up from outside and sending out to outside. And then there are Mysterians. You know what the Mysterians? They, they say, look, here's the problem. We're trying to understand the mind by using the mind. That can't work. And it can't work. <laughs> Understand the mind by using the mind now. So, so there's a, people are trying to understand the mind. Now, uh, there are people who also are still trying to understand what is the physical nature of the mind. And most of them are using quantum dynamics to do that. Um, quantum collapse, quantum dynamics, they're, they're, they're trying to figure out maybe how how the mind is some kind of quantum dynamic. So uh, I read a, a book by a guy named John Eccles, and he wrote this whole book about what happens when I say I'm going to move my arm at the count of three. Okay? So I go one, two, three. And I can do one, two, three. Or one, two, three. Well, we kind of know about the motor neurons and the muscles and, and how I actually do that. But what we don't know is how I do it with intention to do it precisely at the moment I say three. Don't know. Don't know. <laughs> Nobody can tell you how that happens. This guy, Eccles, he wrote a whole book about quantum Dynamics, there's something going on quantumly that enables you to do that, uh, you know. So it, it really is quite mysterious. Now, um, I read a book by a guy named William Uttle, who's a neuroscientist. And uh, the name of the book is Mind and Brain, A Critique of Neuroscience. And what he says, he says, you know, the neuroscientists think they have a theory about how the brain creates the mind, but they don't. They're so far away from having a theory 
about how the mind, uh, the brain creates the mind. And he said they probably never will. Well, because in order to understand the mind, you have to bring it down. You have to reduce it to a point where it's not really the mind anymore, is basically what he would say. So you're really not understanding the mind. Uh, so the relationship between the brain and the mind is very, very mysterious. And he's a neuroscientist. He said they don't have any idea uh, uh, about how, how that happens, the relationship between the brain and the mind. So um, the mind is very useful, uh, powerful, but we really don't know what it is in some ways. It's still a very much, very much mystery. But we can study it through the use of phenomenology, which is the study of experience. So we can help people have different experiences using their minds. Uh, and we can uh, try, we can uh, compare different ways of helping people use their minds in healthy, productive, satisfying, creative ways. And we can study the mind that way. Because I do believe that your experience of using the mind is very similar to mind, to mine. I can't prove that, but I, it seems as if it is. When I talk to people, it seems as if it is. So um, we ought to be studying the mind, and we could do it. And, and we have. You know, all these great psychologists that we talk about from, I don't know, was Aristotle a philosopher? No. But, but let's just start with Freud for the heck of it. <laughs> And just go up through all of the great psychologists that we learn from, that we study. They're all studying the mind. We're not studying the brain. We're trying to understand the mind. And that's what they worked with, was the mind, people's minds. So I have this concern. We're, we're wasting a tremendous amount of money. But I also have a little bit of, um, I say, well, I'm a kind of contrarian, you know. So when I read the neuroscientists, uh, I, I kind of get upset because they say things that are ridiculous. And um, what they do is overstate what they've learned about and how important the brain is. They, I think they seriously overstate how important the brain is. And there's a lot of hubris. You know what hubris is? Kind of a, a naive, exaggerated belief uh, that something is going to work or is, is worthwhile. So I think about it sort of in this way, you know, the neuroscientists, here's, one of the, here's what I would say the problem of neuroscience is. It's like the story of, of the man who's uh, looking for something under a lamppost at night, and somebody asks him, say, well, what are you looking for? And he says, well, I'm looking for my car keys. And the guy says, well, yeah, but did you, did you lose your car keys there? He says, no. Well, then why are you looking there? So, well, that's the only place where there's light. That's the only place I can see. So this is the problem of neuroscientists. The neuroscientists can only see the brain. Uh, they can only do it through MRIs and PET scans and that kind of thing. So they assume that this is all they can study, so they assume this has got to be important. This is where I'm going to find the answer, because this is what, I'm, what I've got to, to, to use. But the problem is they're not going to find the answer there, I don't think. Maybe. Maybe someday. Um, so just as an example of some of, the, some of the stuff they say, here's Eric Kandel, Nobel laureate, right? Who actually worked with sea slug and actually saw what happens in the synapse when the slug learns to avoid uh, a, a shock. As you could see the change. <coughs> but he says, the brain constructs our sensory experience regulates our thoughts and emotions and controls our actions. Really? It is responsible for complex, complex acts that we consider quintessentially human, like thinking, speaking, and creating works of art. So you actually saying that the brain creates works of art. The brain creates works of art? No, I create works of art. You create works of art. And you lose, you're using a lot more than your brain. I don't know. You're using your mind, you're using your imagination. Uh, and I don't think you can say the brain is doing that, right? Um, and then we have uh, Seth Pollack, 
We haven't really understood why things that happen when you're two, three, or four years old stay with you and have a lasting impact. Yet early stress has been linked to depression, anxiety, heart disease, cancer, and a lack of educational and employment success. Given how costly these early experiences are for society, unless we understand what part of the brain is affected, we won't be able to tailor something to do about it, right? Unless we understand what part of the brain is affected, we won't be able to help people who've had difficult early experiences. Hello? <laughs> you haven't heard about psychotherapy? <laughs> you haven't heard about family therapy? You haven't, you know, so there's this kind of ignorance about the power of psychotherapy, you know, among neuroscientists. They have no idea about how effective, how important, how rich, how powerful psychotherapy is. This guy actually is saying, well, we can't help these kids who have attachment problems unless we know where in the brain it's affected. Right? And she said that. Those kind of conclusions are coming from people who are assuming that a slug's brain is the same as a human brain, or a rat, or a monkey, or a rabbit, whatever animals. Yeah. You know, that's something I've often wondered is why they're allowed to make that leap, that right. one neuron is the same as another. Yeah, there are quite a lot of leaps that are made. So uh, just a few more examples. Here, here's a guy that says, therefore, many meditation practices appear to start by activating the prefrontal and cingulate cortex associated with the will or intent to clear the mind of thoughts or focus on an object. Well, when I sit down to quiet down, I, I assure you that I'm not activating my prefrontal cortex <laughs> on my cingulate, and that's not what I'm doing. No, I am focusing on my breathing, I'm relaxing. You know, but this is an example. You say, you say well, you're really activating the prefrontal cortex or the cingulate cortex. Hello? Um, uh, so here's a guy who, who, who says, here's how the, neurosci the neuroscientists do their, do their magic. Yeah. So having outlined your theory, you can cite a finding from a neuroimaging study identifying, for example, activity in a brain region such as the insula. You then select from among the many theories of insula function, choosing the one which best fits with your overall hypothesis but neglecting to mention that nobody really knows what the insula does or that there are many ideas about its possible function. But, you know, we got the insula here and I saw it light up. I saw it light up, so it must be the insula. Now let me see. Now we'll see what the insula supposedly does. Uh, yeah, I can pick that one out. And, but never mentioning that nobody really knows what the insula does or that there are many ideas about its possible function. So there's the kind of, uh, what would you call it? It's sort of like, uh, well, I, I want to call it BS, but I, I won't go with that. <laughs> and here's another one. I think, this is, I think this is right on the mark. A core objection is that neuroscientific explanations often simply restate what is already obvious. We'll be informed that when a teenage boy leaps through the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, areas in his brain associated with sexual desire light up. Wow, what a surprise. Yet asserting that an emotion is really real because you can somehow see it happening in the brain adds nothing to our understanding of it, right? Okay, so you just saw, I had, an, I had some empathy, I felt some empathy, and you just saw where it occurred in the brain. But does that really help me understand what empathy is? Or really, does it help me learn much about empathy? I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I don't need to know what happens in the brain. I don't think. Or if I tell you to use your mirror neurons, do you know what to do? <laughs> use your mirror, come on, use your mirror neurons, <laughs> which are associated with empathy, you know, right? Can you do, as Jonathan Lehrer advises, listen to your prefrontal cortex? <laughs> When's the last time you listened to your free prefrontal cortex? Uh, you get it. I don't have to belabor the point. Um, so, um, so you get the idea. And, and I, let, let me tell you another big mistake that, that neuroscientists make. They have a finding. Here's an example. They, they find that uh, many people who are diagnosed with schizophrenia have large ventricles in the brain. 
Uh, now, this finding is not clear enough to be able to diagnose schizophrenia through any kind of brain scan. And no, no mental illness, quote unquote, is being diagnosed through any kind of brain scan or laboratory finding at all. It's not being done. Probably unethical if it were. But so, so the neuroscientist assumes that it's the large ventricles that cause the, st the state of being that we know is schizophrenia. But it's actually much more likely that the state of being we know as schizophrenia caused the change in the brain. And so when, you know, whenever a scientist has a finding, you always have a question, how do I interpret it? And there's a, there's a, there's a, a principle in science called parsimony. And the principle of parsimony is that when you have a choice of how to interpret something, you use what we already know about other mind-body dynamics. So what do we know? Perhaps the most profound mind-body dynamic that we know about is the stress response. The stress response is a powerful, body-wide physiological response, including more blood flow, uh, more oxygen in the blood, restricted flow in the extremities, uh, high pain threshold, um, neurotransmitter secreted, noradrenaline, norepinephrine, profound stuff going on, blood going to the heart, the muscles, the brain, not to the digestive organs. But it doesn't come out of the blue, right? It's a reaction to something that's happened. The stress response is a reaction to, oh, there's a threat. And not only is that a threat, I better pay attention to it. So there's a cognition going on and a perception. Same with blushing, right? Blushing, I don't just blush. I blush because I'm embarrassed. So the causal relationship goes from the psychological variable, the perception, the cognition, uh, to the brain. That's the, where the causal relationship goes, I think, from what we know. So here's not, I'll give you another little example. Jeffrey Schwartz and his colleagues at uh, UCLA Medical School, they had 15 patients diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, they looked at their brains. All their brains were abnormal. Half of them got drug therapy, SSRIs. Half of them got really cognitive behavioral therapy, changing their attitude towards their thoughts how they manage their thoughts, et cetera. They all improved. And then when they looked at their brains, all of their brains had changed in the same way. Ooh. OK? All of their brains had changed in the same way. The ones who got the cognitive behavioral therapy, their brains changed in the same way as the ones who got the drug. Tibetan monks meditating. You look at their brains when they're meditating, their brains are different. World-class pianists, the part of their brains that uh, process touch, the part of their brains that process touch are much larger than the normal brain, quote unquote. So essentially the brain changes, let me know about the plasticity, the brain changes in, in response to what's going on psychologically, what's happening to the person, how the person's reacting, using their, their thoughts, their emotions, their intentions. So that's much more likely to be the way it goes, rather than the way the neuroscientist will tell you it goes. It goes, well, it's, you know, depression is caused by the chemical imbalances. It's much more likely the other way around. When you become depressed, your brain changes. Uh, so I think it's a big mistake that, that neuroscience makes. So let me just stop and we'll do some talking. We'll, we'll, we'll have a little discussion. Uh, so what, what I want us to do, I just want us to spend more time, more money, especially more of our public money, on studying the mind. Uh, and I want the National Institute of Mental Health to, to start putting money into studying the mind. And we can maybe be very creative about how we do that. I don't know how, how we do it. You might have some ideas. Um, uh, so basically, that's it. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, I think we're wasting a lot of money on studying the brain. I understand it's fascinating, and I can think of ways in which it's useful, and we can maybe, and you can tell me, you know, because you've been around. You can not tell me. You can tell us all. I'd like to hear any ideas about how it might be useful to study the brain, how we may, might get some benefit out of it, and we can wonder about it. Uh, okay? Open it up. Well, I think one of the reasons why all the funding does go to the brain because the, the obviously the ones who hold the money 
come from that kind of perspective, they have to see some type of empirical mm -hmm. ev evidence. And so the brain, you know, so by seeing images, it, it equates to doling out the money. If you're going to start mm -hmm. talking about, oh, we're going to study the brain, they're like, oh, well, I don't know if I want to, I'm holding the money. I don't know if I really want to put my money, you know, bet on something that I can't feel and see and touch right. and see pictures of and, you know. So mm -hmm. I think that that's that's a big part of it, is that you know the the, the, the you know the tangible. Yeah, when I hear you say that, also I, I think that some of it has to do with the um, uh, we fall in love with science, mm -hmm. but not just with science, with a very narrow form of science, mm -hmm. which only science that you can see in a laboratory or quantify or measure or touch. Mm -hmm. You know, science is bigger than that. But I I think I yeah, well, it seems like that's kind of more f tangible or... And to, yeah. to piggyback on that is it's not reproducible to study human potential that is, a, is an aspect or product of the mind because how you would respond with your potential may unfold very differently than me so there's less glamour and less pull if we want to help people to know the answers, you know, or seem like we do, yeah. but the powers and the, the I, I agree, which is I'm uh, it would be very hard to standardize uh, working with the mind. Yeah. Uh, and and one of the one of the values of science of you know narrow science I would say is standardization. Mm -hmm. You know, so the idea of you know manualized therapy doesn't really work very well, mm -hmm. and but it's but it can be studied, so. That's why pretty much cognitive behavioral therapy is the evidence-based the evidence based therapy. I actually have a couple points for your question. Um, one, of, one of the things that, you know, I've kind of found as I've moved through this process of becoming a PhD um, is that historically psychologists have wanted to be at the level of a medical doctor. And so, so there's a lot of that, what is it that we can see, what is it that we can touch, mm -hmm. and that's what we're going to study. Mm -hmm. Based off of my, my dissertation, which isn't quite done yet, <laughs> you go, girl. August, <laughs> um, um, what I know is that NIMH gets a lot of its funding from the big pharma companies, mm -hmm. and Big pharma companies want to sell their drugs. Therefore, if they study the brain first and see how it responds to the body, they can sell their drugs. If they do the body first and then see how it reacts with the brain, NIMH could lose a lot of funding, although I can tell you that they are starting to refuse funding from pharma companies. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, that, that's a, a part of the reason, right? Part of the reason, well, obviously, um, the drug companies have an interest in focusing on the brain because they can do something with the brain. They can make a difference in the brain. And, of course, they spend a lot of money on advertising and sending out the message that, you know, all of these states of being that we're calling mental illnesses, they're just, they're just caused by chemical imbalances and genetic dynamics and brain disorders. They really don't have much to do with your life or your reaction to your life. I don't know if they, if they would agree with that. If you, take, you, know, if you, if you ask them to uh, take this thinking out to its logical conclusion, what you're saying is that people don't have any control over their, their minds, over their states of being. It's all chemical genetics and, and brain disorders, they probably would say, well, no, no. But that's the logical conclusion of it. Personal if you take it. responsibility as well. Personal responsibility, right? You can wipe out personal responsibility, which may be, well, may be one of the reasons why it's attractive, this idea, well, if it's just a physiological dynamic, I'm not to blame for it, right? And the family's not to blame for it. But I, I don't understand how you blame anybody for anything. We don't we don't choose our parents. We don't choose our early experience. You know, we, our early experience isn't under our control. 
and that has great impact on our lives, you know. So blame, I don't understand the whole idea of blame. That's a whole other question. Do you think that there's an instant gratification element in the results? Like if you're going to a cognitive behavioral, <coughs> behavioral therapist, it can take a long time to see a result. Whereas if you, as you used in your early example, get electroshock therapy, it may only last a few months, but it's a much quicker, more, more immediate result. Yeah, well, I definitely think there's something in that. You know, the idea that, uh, well, instead of working on myself or, or asking some questions I may not want to really have to look at, I can, I can take a pill. You know, I, I, I neglected to, um, here are the other risks also with, with intervening at the level of the, of the brain. You know, I talked about the, the side effects, but there's also a very high relapse rate, withdrawal problems, and also a, a, I think a pretty cynical message that if, it's a very cynical message, if you're feeling bad or if you're having a hard time reacting to your life, take this pill, you know. I mean, I don't see how that pill is going to help you learn how to manage yourself, but... It reinforces the message that all of my answers that I need for myself are ex outside of myself. Mm -hmm. Right. It reinforces it, and so, so I don't have to look inside mm -hmm. myself. All the answers are outside of myself. Yeah. Instead, you know, and it's back down to, yeah, personal responsibility. Right, right. Um, you, you made me think of when you say, which I, I totally agree with, the narrow framework that science has... Because when you said that, how can we how can we study the mind? Because we can't we can't. How can a scientist study the mind? And then you think of things where there are limitations that science has based on scientific knowledge. And for example, your example on a anti vivisection of experimenting in animals. How do we know that really transfers to humans? Um, experiments that were done where there wasn't a certain number of protocols, and then a year later, two years later. Five years later, familiarized, you know, there were proof that the, that the science was not safe or the drug wasn't safe. Mm -hmm. So there's that narrow parameter where science decrees this is what's acceptable and this is what we see and therefore it's true. And apparently it's not really true because they have really a limited viewpoint of what they only know, which is going back to that. A scientific point of view. And what they're going to include. And what they're going to include. And true. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the analogy of the, the, the guy looking for his, his keys under the lamplight, you know, and, uh, and you know, Maslow's, Maslow's idea that if, if the only tool you have is a, is a hammer, every problem is a nail. Uh, you know, so you kind of, uh, Maslow, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that came to me is like mind in Portuguese which is influenced by Tupi Guarani language indigenous. Mind uh, is mente, which means lie. Mm. Lie. lie. Wow. So uh, one thing that I'm thinking here is that there is a mis... Uh, it's a place of power. Mm -hmm. So there is a... Let me see if I can come across the talk when I'm trying to... It's about power. Mm -hmm. So... I do not trust this power that I contain, uh, the mind. An indigenous mind is more like interconnected, is not mm -hmm. dualistic. Mm -hmm. Everything, it's a, the cosmos is the, the mind is, everything is connected, right? right so right. Uh, to be able to step out of this dualistic thinking, it, it takes a lot mm -hmm. in terms of evolution of humanity, right? right. So we still playing out this because we are sure. yet, not yet there. Right. Mm -hmm. We still buy mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the pill has the same function that indigenous thinking, that of the magical thinking. Mm -hmm. If I have this, this something will happen. So it's also the indigenous mind. The pill is, uh, they're also using the, mm -hmm. the idea of the mm -hmm. magical mm -hmm. thinking. So they also make use of the same what they push away, they also use it to, in terms of um, making people uh, believe and, and, and pursue that sort of uh, belief. I don't know if I'm coming up with right. yeah, yeah. but I just think it's interesting That's that interesting. some mind... languages, they, they hold um, some meaning, like mainty, lie, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's like interesting. There's like an expression, right? uh, oh, it, it's, the, it's the fault of the main thing, of it, the liar. Wow. The liar. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Because, so, um, uh, well, is that because they think the, the mind can lie, the mind can... Because can we be... don't know the power yet. Uh, we know okay. so little. Mm -hmm. So there is fear. Oh, so it's mysterious. The, mis yeah, the mysteriousness of it. Fear. It, it lies because we can't get a hold of the truth of it, mm -hmm. where, right. it's, where it's going, what we can do with it, what it can do with us, as if we are being um, somehow taken over mm -hmm. <laughs> by uh -huh. its power. So I'm just wondering if there's something... Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but that sounds uh, that's an interesting. I mean, certainly the mystery of the mind, I think, is one of the reasons why uh, scientists aren't aren't really interested in studying it. Most scientists, the mysteriousness of it, and the inability to understand really what it is, and how do you do study it? You know, I think there are ways, but yeah, phenomenology. I just wanted to say to what you just said that what you made me think of was in a lot of indigenous groups you have. The idea of the shaman, and in some of those societies, the shaman has the power that a Western doctor or scientist has. The shaman is told that this is the true thing, and you believe the shaman. And we don't know what the shaman may really know something, but there's a there's that parallel to me of if you can't really know, why would one person know? Exactly. And why would that one person be able to pass that knowledge on to somebody else? Why why would I believe that that if I smoke peyote or do this or do that, this is going to happen. But they're given that kind of power in a certain way, and that it's really sort of, sort of in some ways, sort of ironically similar to the, to the power that's given to scientists and doctors slash scientists right. in, our, in our Western right. society. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, still, it's still propagating that the, the, the mm -hmm. answer is still external. It's yes. the shaman yeah. is still yeah. external. We're, so we're all our own shaman. Yeah. Each individual, we yeah. each mm. have our own, sh we're all our own shaman. If we can find the shaman within, we can find the therapist within, can mm -hmm. we find the doctor within, mm -hmm. we find our own healer within. Mm -hmm. you know, because, I mean, the client is the active healer. Right. And that's the value, I think, of intervening at the level of the mind, helping people become more, uh, more in control of themselves, of their lives, their how they live their lives, agency, I guess. So what about this? Go, go ahead, yeah. Just one thing I wanted to say was that uh, I think we have a fundamental social issue, which is uh, human beings have lost that they're valuable. Yes. So uh, with that, and one thing I think that is the role of every healer is to remind people they're valuable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if it, at a very foundational crack in the whole psyche system of our mm -hmm. humanity, is that we have taught a human humanity that it's not valuable, it's expendable. Mm -hmm. Everywhere from corporations to wars mm -hmm. to... to um, and, uh, and I could see in a society that thinks it's not valuable, that simply being able to feel all right, simply to feel good for a minute, would be probably the only answer. Mm -hmm. You know, the only answer. So that's one thing. The other thing, because I happen to deal in some of the indigenous worlds, uh, there's, a, there's the practitioner that operates on behalf of life, and there's the practitioner that does not operate on behalf of life. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the issue is the shaman, because I actually deal a lot in that sh world, mm -hmm. because the shaman principle is what you talked about, mm -hmm. that it's all on behalf of, that we're a living system, and so you're paying attention to the life force energy of that living system. You're not trying to make somebody stay upright. One of the most shocking healing moments I ever had was when a therapist <laughs> said to me, you, don't, you think being well is standing up. <laughs> right. And that's pretty much our uh, mental system. That's pretty much the doctor uh, drug system. And, and honestly, at that moment, I had no idea there was more than just standing up and trying to function. Uh -huh. And so I think that the, the, the world that you all are in, I'm a visitor, the mm -hmm. world that you all are in is fascinating to me because it's bringing, bottom line, it's bringing the value of the human being back online. Mm -hmm. And not only, that the, because even if you say to somebody you're responsible for your own healing, why? Mm -hmm. I have no value. Why should they even take the measure? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what yeah. does that possibly mean? And what does that possibly mean? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I belong to an organization that uh, the motto is restoring humanity to life. 
destroying humanity and life. So what about this idea, uh, could studying the brain, how could studying the brain be helpful? Any one. thoughts about? Well, I have one because I was a multiple personality, so a lot of us got to look at this. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, when they told me about an amygdala and the midbrain and the corpus callosum, mm -hmm. I was so excited mm -hmm. because it made sense of things that happened in my head that I yeah. didn't have language for. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And um, I think the, I think it's really great to know about the brain and the work I do. That we have to know the different parts of the brain because it gives an identification system but it doesn't give the brain cause. It just gives mm -hmm. us identification systems. So if we have this horrible fright going on, we can say, oh my God, my amygdala is off its charts, not, oh God, I'm dying. So it's, there's an interesting uh, technical thing that can happen when people understand the brain. And in a sad way, you can say, you can blame, it, blame it on the brain, not blame it on yourself. But it, yeah. I think that studying the brain as a as a location of what even what they claim caused things produces a health a healthier relationship with mm -hmm. the person's relationship to their brain. Yeah. I can see how if you see if you can actually see how when a person changes the way they're using their mind, it actually causes a change in the brain and you can see it. I can see in some way that makes it more real, more fundamental is that uh, it makes it more solid somehow wow it really is real maybe and, and as a multiple the psychiatrist this is unbelievable i was it was 1960 in the outback of tennessee oh. unbelievable and the first thing this psychiatrist who never gave me drugs said to me he said do you think you're crazy and i said well everybody says i am and he said well i didn't ask them i asked you and I said, I don't think I'm crazy. And he said, well, we just have to teach you how to live with you. <laughs> and then he said, can you feel your brain? And I said, yes. And he said, can you see where it's broken? And I said, yes. And he said, do you think you can track it with me and we can fix it? And I said, yes. And six years later, I was integrated. Amen. So I have a very healthy respect for saying brain because humanity doesn't know mind. Mm -hmm. but not giving brain the cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a question about how important you want to make the brain. Right. right. And it seems to me neuroscientists make it very important. And uh, I, I don't think it's that important. Yeah. I mean, it certainly is, it certainly is necessary. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient to explain humanity and what we're about and how we do what we do and... You know. Yeah, I have another another one that I think it may be helpful to have the mind map or the brain mapped, and that's dealing with traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. I dealt with that a lot in my internship, mm -hmm. and it was helpful to know what the injury was, either from a stroke or from an accident or whatever, mm -hmm. and to be able to watch the mind reroute around that area, because a lot of times. We were, we were implementing therapy, hoping for a routing pattern, which takes time mm -hmm. to build the neurons. Mm -hmm. um, and if we were going in the wrong direction, we would know about it mm. sooner. Yeah, so that, that was an example of the usefulness of knowing about the brain. It just reminded me of one of the ma most amazing things about the plasticity of the brain that I learned was that uh, people who are blind um, don't have a use for their optic nerve. Um, so what happens, the optic nerve, the nerve then becomes able to process touch. It changes in the brain so it can process touch. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, this is something we're learning about, uh, the amazing ability of the brain to adjust to experience, to the experience of the human being, uh, and to how the human being is thinking, feeling, intending, reacting. The brain just in amazing, amazing ways. There's, there's another area, and this is um, a little bit different than what we've been talking about, but where brain studies have been helpful. And that has been recently, in 2012, uh, at the Cambridge um, uh, meeting of neuroscientists, it was finally declared that um, other animals have a brain functioning similar to humans. I mean, despite the ironic fact that they're... <laughs> 
<laughs> long time studies on other animals than equated to humans, but that other other animals, and they, they actually name a variety of them, um, have uh, functions similar to us. And the difference, of course, that that makes mm -hmm. is that an other animals, non-human animals, may be treated differently in the future mm -hmm. to have a group wow. of neuroscientists coming out and, and declaring mm -hmm. that. Wow. Yeah. You can see it online. It's the mm -hmm. Cambridge see, Declaration of Consciousness. <laughs> wow. Other animals have consciousness. Uh, now, m many of us have known yeah. that. <laughs> other animals have emotions. Many yeah. of us have what did you that. call it, Cambridge what? The Cambridge yeah. Declaration of Consciousness. Wow, what a title. Well, all, all mammals have amygdalas mm -hmm. in their brains, and, and the, the amygdala processes emotions. Yeah. So we want to know why dogs, why dogs have emotions. Well, they have amygdalas. <laughs> yeah. So there's ways in which studying the brain, yeah, it definitely can be useful. Um, yeah. I, I have to say I'm a, I, I teach kids with special needs and I educate my parents about the auditory and visual channels mm -hmm. and how to look for that. And that's how I can tell parents, you know, your child is accessing visually versus auditorily and I learned that from brain study. And I use it a lot um, um, when I'm educating my parents. So for me, that's huge. Yeah. Uh, can you learn that without looking at the brain? Can you learn how a child is processing, whether they're processing auditorily or visually or in some other way, kinesthetically? Uh, can um, you learn that just from watching the child or giving the child different in all experiences? Honesty, it was this knowledge that, that gave me the window into how they think okay. and how they learn, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you can, you can study and see, well, you know, are, how are they learning? Sure, are they, are, are they tending to write down things more, meaning they're more kinesthetic, or um, do, they, do they get their knowledge from hearing? I mean, yes, you can do that. You can do um, that through yeah. seeing their experiences. Yeah. 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 But I learned by reading their eyes, so, <laughs> and where they're accessing. Um, so. Yeah. And educating them from that standpoint. Right. Perhaps it's not really a question of one or. Both and. But both and. Yeah. Yeah. I sort of toned down my thing by saying, well, we ought to be spending at least as much money on studying the brain. I mean the mind. Okay, let's study at least as much on studying the mind as the brain, you know. Hey, you, you brought up uh, Rupert Sheldrake and yeah. morphic resonance, and isn't that kind of what... What he's saying is that uh, it is and both, that the mind is outside and our, and our brain is just part of outside, but it's what it's a, we're re a recepting, it's a receptor of everything that's going on and we're all picking up from each other and we're all sharing information with the, with the environment, with each other, and um, that's what I kind of get from Cheryl Sheldrake's morphic resonance, it is and both. He's yeah. At as and both in the brain. Yeah, I, th I think he's. Um, yeah, as I understand, that's what he's saying. He's saying it's a transmitter, and that makes sense to me because I know thoughts are electric. They're essentially electrochemical dynamics. So thoughts and electricity can go through matter. It can come in. So it, it makes some sense to me. I think that uh, that's something to look at. But I, you know, one of the things I think about, I say, well, you know. When a person in psychotherapy has an insight that may be very helpful, you know, that, oh, uh, no wonder I'm breaking up relationships um, before they can really go anywhere because, you know, I had this kind of fear and this came from my early life. You know, I don't need to know what's happening in the brain uh, when that happens to know that it's useful mm -hmm. and helpful. Mm -hmm. And I didn't need to know much about the brain to help that person do that either. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually 4.30. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you.